Good evening, everyone. My name is Benedict Leica, Executive Director of the Redwood Library, and I am presenting from the historic Redwood Library in Newport, Rhode Island. I want to welcome all of you this evening. Uh, many new names and faces that I haven't recognized, so welcome to all you newcomers. Uh, first of all, I want to alert you to some technicalities. Uh, up on the upper right hand corner, you can find the help button, which you can then click and um, hit compatibility so that you uh, no longer have problems with sound. We've found that over the last few weeks that can be helpful. Um, I would also invite all of you newcomers to join the Redwood Library. If you can. Uh, and uh, alert you also at the bottom right hand of the uh, donate button. We're always uh, welcoming uh, contributions of all kinds. Uh, so um, <laughs> this evening we have a very special program by Mr. Bill Ludwig, uh, who will present his new book, Chasing Labyrinths, A Guide to Labyrinths of Connecticut and Rhode Island. I must admit that this isn't a topic that I'm very familiar with, but um, I, I think it's gonna be very interesting to people. We've had a, a number of people who've already written in this evening uh, expressing their interest in creating labyrinths on their properties. Um, he will be talking about the fascinating world of labyrinths, uh, specifically in Connecticut and Rhode Island. And I'll be interested to know uh, why it might be that labyrinths were especially popular in this part of the world. Um, and I suspect he'll be able to tell us that. Now, Mr. Ludwig is a Connecticut native. Uh, he's a longtime resident of Brantford, Connecticut. For decades, he was a partner in Garland Publishing, an academic and science publisher, where he fulfilled a variety of roles. Uh, he uh, left Garland in 1997, and he took a few years to pursue his love of sailing and travel, where he also obtained his captain's license. He then returned to what he knew best, founding Hotchkiss Publishing, a spiritual and recovery publisher. This led to a sequence of events that guided him to become interested in labyrinths, and he began looking for them wherever he traveled. Uh, in the fall of 2017, prior to walking the Camino de Santiago from Lourdes, he decided upon his return, he would create a guidebook to the labyrinths of Connecticut and Rhode Island. So uh, this is where we are this evening, well, where he will uh, present his uh, new book and his research on said topic. So uh, I'm sorry I've taken so long. I wanna welcome everyone and uh, welcome Mr. Ludwig and uh, have a great evening. And here he is, Bill Ludwig, it's all you. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. And thank you for the wonderful introduction and thank you to, I see 57 people, I'm amazed. Uh, thank you all for uh, um, clicking in and joining. Uh, hopefully I can um, answer a few questions you have about labyrinths. I see a couple of people are interested in actually building labyrinths. And so perhaps you'll get some ideas from the labyrinths that exist in, uh, in, in the book in Connecticut and Rhode Island. But uh, I will go uh, click on to um, my PowerPoint and um, we'll begin with this il illustration, which uh, this is the, uh, the, the uh, labyrinth that is uh, featured on the cover of the book. And uh, this is a labyrinth in, uh, nor in uh, West Hartford at Holy Family Retreat. It's a, a beautiful labyrinth. It's, um, they have about 30 acres uh, on their campus there, and this is out in the woods away from uh, the hustle and bustle and it's it's really lovely the paths are wide uh they're handicapped accessible with uh an interesting thing is that the stones a lot that make the border 
are cobblestones recycled from the streets of New York. I'm not quite sure how they pull that off, but uh, it made for a it makes for a beautiful, beautiful labyrinth, and it's a, a wonderful, wonderful one, especially with that lovely sculpture you see in the center. But we mentioned uh, how did I get interested in labyrinths, and uh, it. I got my interest in labyrinths came about when in 1996, I knew nothing about labyrinths, but I was trying to find a cover for a book I was doing, uh, Dear Friend, uh, Volume 2, uh, by, it was written by a cousin of mine, Sandy Beach. And my book designer kept sending me very nice covers, but they weren't, they weren't doing, they weren't speaking to me at all. So a young friend of mine suggested a website that I go search and I put in spiritual path in this website and up came this lovely image of this of a woman walking this uh, labyrinth on a beach, uh, which I've come to find out that this labyrinth is actually out in San Francisco. But it uh, was perfect. It was perfect for the book, especially with Sandy Beach as an author. But it led me to wonder why was this, why did it come up under my spiritual path? How, how was a labyrinth a spiritual path? And how was it different from a maze? And so uh, I did a little research and learned that one, uh, that actually both mazes and what we think of as labyrinths are both labyrinths. Uh, the one on the left is, that we would typically just call a labyrinth today is a universal labyrinth in that there's only one path that leads to the center, as opposed to a maze labyrinth, which you see on the right, which is the puzzle type maze with dead ends and uh, little things to trick you, like the corn mazes that we see uh, this time of year in New England. So the uh, acute saying that uh, people have come up with is that mazes, the ma purpose of a maze is to keep you from finding the center and the purpose of a labyrinth is to help you find your center. And that's really, uh, that's, a, that's a huge difference, needless to say. So my uh, learning about labyrinths and being led and uh, pursuing labyrinths, it had a parallel path. And at the, at the same time that I was de designing that book, uh, a young friend of mine sent me a blog of uh, this gentleman on the left uh, who was walking the Camino de Santiago. And as I read his blog, as he walked across Spain, it started tugging at my soul. And uh, this, uh, both are a, a form of meditation. One is a little longer than the other. One goes around in, in, in circles and the other is quite linear, but they're both walking meditations. And they both came to me at, at very much the same time. And as I believe was said in the introduction that my wanting to do uh, uh, a book came about uh, because of my walking the labyrinth, uh, walking the Camino. Uh, so here we are at the beginning of uh, 2017, and this is the first labyrinth that I ever walked. And it, it really wasn't planned out. It just happened to work out that I did it on January 1st of 2017 at the First Church of Christ in Woodbridge, Connecticut, where I was born. So there were a lot of firsts uh, going on there, and it was an appropriate place, and I'm very happy that that was the first labyrinth I walked. But it was 2017 that I also went on to walk the Camino de Santiago, and uh, and everything starts with the first step. I, it's, I'm blessed in that from my house here in Brantford, I can walk to the train station. So I actually began my pilgrimage in the front door and uh, also 2017. So I began my pilgrimage in Lourdes, uh, France for a number of reasons and walked for a week through the Pyrenees before uh, taking a left and joining the fronts. Uh, French route across uh, across the Pyrenees and across the north of Spain. Uh, and I may have the wrong. Oh yeah, no, I have the right, I have the right, right slide. So anyway, so you get re you're guided on the Camino by all these little signs that come along. Um, 
uh, it, guiding you. I started out with maps and found out I didn't need them because there were these markers all over uh, telling you which way to go. So, and uh, and just as with labyrinths, they the labyrinth guides you. And so it, it's a, a very different form of meditation, very different form of uh, uh, pursuing this. But it was going on uh, the Camino. Before I left on the Camino, I knew I needed something to come back to. I knew I needed a goal and uh, that having a book, it, it, so it occurred to me that doing a book on labyrinths would be a uh, wonderful project for when I returned from my trip. However, halfway across uh, Spain, I discovered this amazingly large labyrinth. I call these a uh, spontaneous labyrinth. People just keep adding rocks to them. They tend to be spiral and just go on and on and on. And this was huge. And I happened to be walking with a young lady who I just met that morning uh, who was from the Netherlands. And I said, I really wanted to stop and walk this. And she said, fine. So she went on ahead and I followed a few steps behind and we walked and walked and walked and walked in silence. And it must've taken 20 minutes to get to the center of this labyrinth. And when we did, she turned around, opened her arms and I walked into them. And little did I know that our souls were gonna collide so uh, I've spent the last, we were together for two days, uh, then she left. I walked another 500 kilometers wondering what happened. And we've spent the last three years commuting back and forth to the Netherlands. So here I made, uh, and at this pilgrimage, uh, a million one three hundred thousand steps along the way. And uh, and then back to the States to begin working on chasing labyrinths. So it took me a little longer than expected to produce this book. Um, one, because it was a little more work than I expected. And two, because the commuting of back and forth to the Netherlands certainly delayed things uh, probably a year. So, but it came out uh, May of this year uh, a difficult time to be bringing a book out is I don't think I have to explain. Uh, and, but it's been it's been very well received. Uh, and I think one reason it's been really well received uh, and people have been picking it up is because walking labyrinths is a really good social distancing thing to be doing at this time. And uh, running and chasing around as I found I was doing to find all these. Uh, it makes for it makes for a wonderful day trip, a day uh, you know staycation type of thing to go go find a labyrinth and and travel to a town or a part of your state, uh, Connecticut or Rhode Island in this case that perhaps you've never been to and uh, and so here is just uh, Connecticut uh, I list 50 labyrinths in Connecticut and this little map's in the front of the book. There's one in the back for uh, Rhode Island as well. So that you can look and reference and see that I'm going to be up in Northwest Connecticut or up around Hartford and and see that there are a number of labyrinths around to go visit. So here is one labyrinth in Connecticut uh, at the Episcopal Church in Waterbury. It's a lovely labyrinth. It's it, the picture doesn't show this, but it's really right on the street. It's in downtown uh, Hartford, uh, downtown Waterbury. You can park right next to this uh, and walk right in and, and walk this lovely labyrinth. And the pattern here is the pattern. It's a classic pattern of uh, that reproduces the pattern of the labyrinth in Chartres, France, and where there is a labyrinth built in the, of stone into the floor of the cathedral, and it's about 800 years old. So that's a, a very often reproduced either in its 11 circuit form or in modified versions of usually often seven circuits. Here is another, as I said, a spontaneous labyrinth. This is a labyrinth on the beach at Hamanasset Park. And uh, many of the people that run the park don't even know it exists. 
uh, it's just built out in one far corner from the far east end, end of the um, park on the beach. And people have just over the years uh, added stones to it. And it's gotten bigger and bigger until now it's it can't get any bigger. It, uh, the tide comes in and pushes it around and the winter storms push it around a little bit. But people come back and straighten it out and neaten it up. And I was just there a couple of weeks ago and it is in beautiful, beautiful condition. And it is a wonderful little hidden treasure. And, and again, one of the reasons for doing this book is to bring these things to people's attention. There are a number of people that will walk this beach and not notice that there's a labyrinth there. And uh, they just think it's just a random pile of rocks. Here's another very different labyrinth, different shape, different design. This was built in, uh, into the foundation of a 100-year-old barn that had been on the property. And the couple that own this uh, have a little uh, wellness business on the property. And they, held, uh, they hold events on the labyrinth from time to time. They're doing one this Friday that I'm going to help them out with. But this is, they've done a really interesting job of this. The pattern is very different. It's just, it goes back and forth and, um, you know, obviously in box shape, but they've populated the labyrinth pathways with lots of different little artifacts that are fascinating to pause and, 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 and just, you know, view as you go through and uh, enjoy your walk. It makes for a very, very different type of, labyrinth experience and then at the uh, far end it doesn't end in the middle it ends at uh, the far end where you see this little uh, symbol here and they have a fire pit and uh, it's a, it's a whole different approach to labyrinth use and design but it's uh, I'll be curious to, I haven't uh, done an event there before and so I'll be very interested to participate and see how she holds her events on Friday. Next up we have, this is a labyrinth in the middle of Connecticut and in Litchfield. And uh, this is an interesting, I found an interesting fact that this was built in 1996, making it the oldest permanent labyrinth in, uh, in the state. It's spawned quite a few other labyrinths around the state. Many people have gone up to the Wisdom House as a retreat center, and, and people have often gone there on retreat, returned to their homes, to their home churches or to their neighborhoods, uh, and decided to build a, a, a labyrinth and pattern it after this, uh, this pattern. It's a pretty a very classic pattern. It just wanders back and forth without any extra turns. So why do we walk labyrinths and uh, what are the benefits? You know, I often, I, I find for me a very useful uh, thing is to remind me that I need to trust that I'm on the right path. And sometimes when I end up in that type of um, uh, questioning what I'm doing or uh, uncertain of if I'm, uh, you know, I get doubt when you get in the, that little period of doubt pops up in your head. And I'll go over and I'll walk the labyrinth here in Brantford and just to just kind of walk along and learn and trust that you're on your path, you know, because there's just one way to go. The turns come and the turns uh, uh, go and you end up where you're supposed to be in the center. The other thing and which makes this useful is uh, the mindfulness. And mindfulness has become a very popular uh, term, mindfulness meditation. And it's a way to stay in the moment. And I like walking meditation, but having a labyrinth as a tool for that walking meditation helps you, brings you into the present because you have to focus on the pathway that you're walking. And as you focus on that pathway, the noise in your mind or in my mind often will start to fade away. 
And uh, so hopefully by the time you get to the center, you've got a clear mind and perhaps there's some space for uh, uh, a solution to whatever your problem is or a, a new perspective on uh, your day. A variety of things can pop up. Another is acceptance and uh, to not fight the path you're on, accept the path you're on, which uh, if you think of, um, you could easily on many of these labyrinths, just hop over the paths and go right, right to the center. But if you do that, you're cheating yourself. You're not walking your path. You're not staying on your path. And uh, if you then imagine walls on either side of the path, you know, you're going to get hurt trying to take those shortcuts. And so if you just relax and follow your pathway, you, with patience, end up at the center one step at a time. And one thing that I meant to mention in the slide before was that that uh, that one labyrinth that I said was built in Connecticut in 1996, uh, that I checked on an online database and in 1998, there were only 100 labyrinths listed in the United States. And I recently checked, and there are now 4,400 labyrinths listed in the United States. Most of the labyrinths have been created since the millennium. Since the, uh, 2000, it seems that there's been a shift in this mindfulness and awareness and a different, different uh, spirituality, you know, whatever. And, uh, and people have really taken to building labyrinths. There's a woman out on the West Coast, Lauren Artris, who in the 90s really started championing. She formed a labyrinth association, a labyrinth society, and has really done, she's really spearheaded this growth, at least in the United States, of adding, building so many labyrinths around the country. Now, here's back to Rhode Island, and here's the most well-known and probably the most well-walked labyrinth in Rhode Island. I'm told that in season, this labyrinth on Block Island has, has about 50 to 75 people a day come and walk it, which is remarkable. It's a beautiful labyrinth. The site is lovely. It's out Corneck Road. It's not convenient. For, you have to go out of your way to get to it, but people do. It's, uh, it's worth it. It's a beautiful spot. It's a, a views in 360 degrees. The woman who created this labyrinth, uh, had, she decided uh, she, uh, there's a little side garden and there's a box there in which she has a journal and people have over the years left notes and reflections and whatnot. And she published a book that's now, I believe, out of print but Letters from the Labyrinth, uh, Block Island Turning Point uh, is the name of her association. Barbara McDougall is the woman who wrote the book and created this labyrinth for all to share. She, I was surprised, I was talking to her one day and she didn't know that this labyrinth is on the Block Island tourist map. <laughs> so, and uh, hopefully it stays there for many years. Not all labyrinths are outside. They take on many versions. And in my book, I've just done uh, permanent to semi-permanent labyrinths. There are also canvas labyrinths uh, that people make, portable labyrinths to be able to host events uh, here and there. But a few are built inside and inside churches and, they're, and many of them like this one is lovely. And this is a, a a modification of the chart uh, pattern. It's beautifully done. The indoor labyrinths, you really need to call ahead to see if they're available because often the per rooms are multi-purpose rooms and have uh, are being used for something, something else and covered with chairs or whatever. But this one is uh, lovely. I don't know, uh, people have asked, I don't know what this oversized mannequin in the back is all about. But Now here's a very informal labyrinth and there are a couple in the book like this and I really, really find them personally uh, a lovely um, uh, experience. 
uh, you know, you're in nature. In this case, you're, I mean, you're walking around the trees and the, the, they're all incorporated in the labyrinth. It's um, uh, peaceful between the labyrinth, the nature, the rocks. In this case, there's a lot of moss under underfoot. It's just a, a lovely, lovely experience. And uh, but I do have to do have to note that I, I photographed all the labyrinths in the book with a drone. And this type of labyrinth is really challenging to try to fly up among the trees and the leaves without crashing. So I was uh, pretty proud of myself for coming out and getting this photo without crashing my drone. So here is a very unique labyrinth that is built once a year in uh, at Norwalk Community College. And I just got an email today that she is about to build it again, starting again this weekend. She builds a labyrinth every year using goose feathers. She builds a different pattern every year, depending on what's going on in the world and what she thinks she wants to represent or reflect. And this year she was just doing a simple spiral it uh it's 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 almost permanent she puts it in this time of year as i said she'll build it this weekend and it lasts until late summer because they only uh, they don't mow this hillside until late summer early fall so for most of the year this labyrinth is there and there to walk and uh here it is completed and i note that no geese were injured an interesting thing is she's found a nearby cemetery where a flock of geese come every spring and they molt their feathers. And she runs around and picks up all the feathers and sorts them into left and right so they curve in the right direction when she's building her labyrinth. And um, and and every year builds a new builds a new labyrinth. They're quite quite lovely. Every once in a while, she sticks in a turkey feather or two just to break things up. But it's uh, it's if you happen to find yourself in Norwalk, Connecticut, it's worth a ride by. Here's in Rhode Island, another labyrinth uh, that's very new. Uh, I think it was just built two years ago, and uh, it's rectangle. It's it's square and uh, with square corners and square in rectangle. You know, right angle turns, and so they can be any kind of uh, uh, pattern. Uh, this is an interesting case of a, 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 a labyrinth that has narrow pathways, uh, but nevertheless could be handicapped accessible because it is two dimensional. So uh, somebody in a wheelchair could roll along just following the pathway and not having to worry about whether the wheels stay between the lines. So it can be a dual dual purpose. And this, uh, for their courtyard at, at Grace Episcopal, they use the courtyard for many different purposes and realized that they could create this pattern on the, uh, uh, on the courtyard surface and have an extra use uh, by having this labyrinth available to people when they weren't using it for other events. And so it's it's quite lovely. I've been told that they've restained some of the stones so that the pathway is a little bit more distinct. So here was my first attempt at building a labyrinth in my backyard. Uh, and uh, this I did, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, it must've been the winter of uh, 2017. And uh, I stopped around, stopped around. One of my neighbors later told me that they were really wondering if I'd lost, gone off the rocker because she couldn't understand why I was just stomping around and around and around and around in my backyard for, I, it was quite a while, an hour or two. So anyway, but that was, uh, it was fun. But that was the beginning and that was my first, first labyrinth. I never thought it would lead to anything more, but this is my second attempt at a labyrinth, and that was uh, just last year. And this is a labyrinth that I created for my town here in Brantford, Connecticut. And 
the local quarry donated all the material and it was uh, it was it was just a wonderful thing i just kind of put it out there to the first selectman and they said he said fine the town crew cleared the site for me the local quarry donated all the material and uh, a friend helped me lay it out and i have to say i was quite impressed it came out much better than i imagined it ever would uh, it took me longer scratching my head planning on how to do it than actually doing it but it and this is 72 feet in diameter and here's the finished version um the local uh, local fishermen uh donated the seashells for the corners and the quarry also donated some finished stone uh with a infinity in the center representing for me, infinite possibilities. And then the threshold says, uh, say yes to the universe, which is a, an expression that I came across uh, only about four or five years ago and has changed my life and opened the door for me to do things like build a labyrinth or write a book. And uh, I've been in publishing my entire career uh, since 1969, and it never occurred to me that I'd ever write a book. So uh, uh, I'm pleased to say I have. So here is uh, even a, a newer labyrinth. This is not in the book. I just discovered this uh, a few weeks ago. This is here in Guilford, Connecticut. And I heard about it, and uh, the person from the church called me to ask me about who might help them build the labyrinth. So they, they plan to do a labyrinth, but they haven't been able to raise the funds yet to hire someone to build it. So someone with the, in the church took it upon themselves to paint the labyrinth on the grass. And, uh, and God bless him, he comes back every week after the lawn's mowed and repaints the labyrinth. So it's, uh, it's, kind, of, uh, it's kind of fun. So they're growing uh, as we speak. So here's a... Uh, <laughs> thing that I've uh, come across that people say, how do you, what do you do in walking a labyrinth? What's the right way to walk a labyrinth? Well, in, as far as I'm concerned, there's no one right way to walk a labyrinth. You walk it however it works for you. But one of the basic things that people refer to are the three R's uh, for walking a labyrinth that, you know, perhaps at the beginning, you may set an int intention for your walk. And on the way in, you release your you release your thoughts, you release your troubles, you release the uh, things that are bothering you. Uh, as I said, you know, you'd focus on the pathway and the mindfulness, and hopefully, all the clutter and busyness drifts away from the mind. In the center, pause, and perhaps receive some inspiration. Perhaps you don't. Perhaps you receive nothing but some quiet. And on the way out, reflect on whatever it was that you received or didn't receive. And some people pray, uh, the labyrinth that I uh, built for the town of Bradford, uh, it turned out after I designed it and laid it out that somebody has a copyright on it. And uh, she refers to it as the labyrinth of peace. And the design, the way it works is there are 12 corners, 12 turns, and so some people will stop and pray and do the Stations of the Cross as they walk through uh, that labyrinth. And some people use them for other rituals uh, and that I don't know anything about. And, uh, but here we are, here's the little map of uh, Rhode Island with 40, showing there are 14 labyrinths that I discovered in Rhode Island. Uh, there may be a few others uh, that didn't get in the book. Um, they keep being built all the time, and they're not always easy to find out about. I did a lot of Google searches. I largely used a online database called the Worldwide Labyrinth Locator. It's a wonderful thing. It's what got me going on this. So I would use this Worldwide Labyrinth Locator to find labyrinths wherever I went when I was traveling in the United States as well as in Europe. And um, it, it adds another dimension to travel, and it was wonderful. The thing that it was lacking was it wasn't uh, necessarily up to date, often didn't have photographs, and rarely told you much of anything about the labyrinth. 
on why it was built, or, you know, or anything about the design. So here we are back in, in, in Rhode Island, and this is a lovely labyrinth setup. It's a, a series of series of gardens at the church that uh, that uh, they built. There's a memorial garden, there's a fountain garden, there's a meadow garden, a uh, intention garden, and then they built this uh, labyrinth. Uh, they also have a little lending library, one of those little you know uh, box uh, free libraries. But uh, this is it's just a beautiful setting. It's about an acre next to the church that's been set aside for these gardens so it's really if you're in if you're in that area and you're near near cumberland it's really wonderful it's open uh during daylight to anybody there's a nice parking lot right next to it as you can you can see and it's very convenient a uh, nice place to go spend a little time walk the labyrinth sit in one of their meditation gardens and uh and enjoy some solitude And here is uh, one in Newport. That this is the one that I came across uh, later, uh, just before the book was going to go to the printer, and was able to get it in. Uh, I have not walked it, and I look forward to getting up to Newport one day soon, and uh, before this uh, season is out this year, and walking it, assuming that the uh, mansions are open uh, and that the grounds are open. But this is really an old labyrinth and uh, that this was built in 1974 as part of the Monumenta art exhibit and of uh, my understanding it is the only artifact left is still existing uh, in Newport uh, from that exhibition and so it's a, a, a really is a special thing it's on uh, I had the note here somewhere I think it's 200 it's 142 feet wide and um, so it's huge and it's just it's just lovely. So I really look forward to uh, getting up and walking that. I think it would be really beautiful this time of year when the leaves start changing to, uh, to go stroll around this beauty. Another, uh, new, another uh, Rhode Island labyrinth. Uh, this, is, this is behind the church. Uh, you, you, you have to know how to find it. And, and it's uh, in the book. I believe the, the directions are pretty good, but you park in the parking lot and then you see this pathway that goes back uh, into the into the woods and bushes. And, uh, and you come to this wonderful clearing where there's a, a little seating area, fire pit, and this uh, very freeform uh, labyrinth. And uh, as you can perhaps guess by uh, its shape, they what they used for laying out this labyrinth was they used a rope <laughs> and uh, they they used a rope and then uh painted where the rope was uh was laying and so it's uh, created a wonderful um uh, classic uh labyrinth uh just back and forth and with wonderful little weaves as it wanders around it's a, a lovely lovely spot again it's away from uh, it's very quiet it's a wonderful little retreat this is a, a, a small labyrinth in Narragansett, but the setting is just stunning. The church is beautiful. This garden is beautiful. The, the execution of the, this labyrinth is just uh, is just stunning. It's um, you know obviously it isn't going to take you all day to walk it, but it is. Um, it's just it, it it's lovely. It really is. It's just it's tucked in the corner of the church in this garden, and uh, and I love it. It's one of my favorite pictures in the book. Another uh, in uh, Providence, this one is uh, the Church of the Redeemer. It's it's uh, very unpretentious. It's just, you know, follow the follow the pavers and uh, follow the pavers to the center. And uh, it's it's built by the side of the church uh, between the church and the street. So they, they located where they did to try to welcome uh, people passing by to just kind of come in and walk the labyrinth and take a little time. And there's, I think there's a couple of uh, benches nearby to sit and, and relax. So it's, it's wonderful that they made it in such a simple 
and welcoming fashion. In Providence, we have uh, also the uh, Congregational Church, the Central Con Congregational Church. It's this lovely, very formal, uh, uh, a pretty much manufactured uh, labyrinth. There's a company in Connecticut called uh, the Labyrinth Company, and they make up labyrinths just like this. I don't know if it's, this is one of theirs, but I suspect it probably is, where you can buy the labyrinth um, designed and uh, and they'll send you all the stones and you can lay them out or you can have a landscaper uh, do the do the project and they the end result is is a lovely uh, lovely labyrinth in this case they made a beautiful little garden around it and uh, it is worth a visit it's around the back side of the church you, you'd actually uh, enter from the street that runs parallel uh, to the church the uh, if you have interest and in call ahead, this is a church that also has an indoor labyrinth as well in the church, uh, in the basement uh, of the church, uh, in a room that, as I mentioned, is uh, often used for uh, multiple uh, functions. But if you have an interest, do call ahead, ask if it's available, and you'll be able to go check that out and do two at one stop. <laughs> This labyrinth in uh, Fagan Park uh, in South Kingston was built by, uh, by a young lady who did it as a, uh, a project. She was, um, she was apparently bullied in high school. And, and this was a high school, I believe it was a Girl Scout project for her that she did as a way of just wanting to offer some peace to the community and, uh, and to offset the bullying. And so um, it's a it's a it's a it's a special story behind it. Uh, this is a picture that she supplied me with uh, when I visited. It didn't look wasn't quite as well maintained as it appears here. But that's often the case with these labyrinths. Uh, some are sometimes they're kept up. Sometimes they, you know, go f a little follow for a while, and then somebody comes along and get its interest in it, and then they get fixed up again. And occasionally they're abandoned, and uh, so um, they there's they and then there are new ones being built all the time, as I mentioned. And here is uh, I'll just put in a little plug uh, a finger labyrinth that uh, can be done on paper, can be done a lot of different ways. This is one that I uh, mold into uh, into a piece of uh, leather and uh, leather finger labyrinth. Uh, if anybody wants to contact me. I don't have it on my website, uh, but I can make them up uh, per or to order. So that uh, is it. My book, uh, Chasing Labyrinths, is available on Amazon. It's available through my website, hotchkisspublishing.com. Uh, you can contact me either by the phone number listed there or my email is bill at hotchkisspublishing.com. I'd be happy to. Uh, communicate with you uh, in any fashion and answer any questions. And so that's the end of this. And I will go back to you. Mr. Ludwig, thank you so much for this uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, I hadn't quite realized that there was a labyrinth at uh, Chateau-sur-Mer down the street. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't, I'm not sure that it's much advertised at all. Uh, what's interesting to me too, I mean, silly as it may seem, um, when I think of labyrinth, I always think of the cornfields, a, a sort of vertical wall-like effect that drives you, whereas in many of the ones that you showed tonight, it's essentially a path on the ground. Uh, two-dimensional and that's one of the reasons for the book is it's very hard to find two-dimensional labyrinths they can be you know it can, it, it can be uh you know 20 feet away and you don't see it and uh my brother and i actually went looking for one at, at a church in san diego one time in uh, a brand new catholic church out there and we walked up and walked to the parish house and asked where the labyrinth was and they told me that we just walked across it <laughs> it was it was in a pattern in the in the in the walkway uh, as that one in the providence church 
uh, was. And we, we, I was looking at, for gardens in behind the church. And if I'd looked down, I would have realized I was on the pat on the labyrinth already. So, uh, let me look real quick to see if we have any questions. Uh, I'm looking at the various comments. Let's move up and see what we got. Uh, I, I'm not seeing any, um, is, does it, is there a reason that labyrinths seem to be popular in Connecticut and Rhode Island? Well, there, it's not just Connecticut and Rhode Island. I, I did the book in Connecticut and Rhode Island only because it's convenient <laughs> to me. And, uh, I really want to do a book in Massachusetts. Uh, there are a uh, hundred labyrinths in Massachusetts, and uh, and many of them in the eastern part of Massachusetts, around the Boston area, is just littered with uh, labyrinths. There's a beautiful labyrinth that many people don't aren't aware of that's uh, right across from Faneuil Hall, and uh, in the uh, in the park, uh, and it's a beautiful, beautiful, huge labyrinth. And uh, so again, without uh, without uh, you know, some sort of guidance, uh, either getting online or finding a book as, as a reference, uh, you, you can pass these up very easily. Uh, why they, uh, you know, uh, they're all built for different reasons. Uh, you know, different people that have different inspirations. Uh, many of them, the, certainly the majority of them are at churches, but uh, a number of them are in people's backyards. There are quite a few private ones I didn't include in the book because people didn't want them in the book uh, for uh, a variety of a variety of reasons, and uh, but they're being built more and more, and uh, and I think it's um, you know it's hard it's hard to really say why uh, you know as as was noted in one of the comments and as I mentioned that Lauren Artris uh, really started getting uh, raising the awareness of labyrinths uh, in the 90s. And that has uh, accelerated uh, as we hit the turn of the century. I think the turn of se the century, the millennium, really was a shift in spirituality and people being interested in spirituality and, and, and mindfulness and meditation. And so the labyrinth is a wonderful tool for meditation. It's a wonderful tool for uh, spiritual development. A lot of people like them. Uh, if, uh, again, they put them in churches. Uh, uh, on church properties and again inside, uh, just for the, that purpose. And, and sometimes they they hold events that are group walks, uh, and uh, and you know group walks are not being done uh, that much now. I'm doing a, a full moon walk tomorrow night in Bradford at our labyrinth here, but it's over a two hour time frame, so that people can kind of come and walk it when they want to. Not everybody's in the labyrinth at the same time, so we can still do these things and respect social distancing. And I think at this time, with with COVID and with the uh, everything that's going on, the people are using the lab. I know the one in Brantford, people are walking it a lot more often than uh, they did last year and uh, I've gotten feedback from other people at, with other their labyrinths that they're seeing a lot more use because uh, it's a it's a, a, a great way to reduce stress and in a stressful time. Let me ask you. I had to step away for a minute. You might have touched on it during the talk. Um, what what is there an identifiable earliest labyrinth in America? Were there any 18th century labyrinths? Oh, labyrinths, labyrinths uh, uh, go through the millennium. They go back, they date back uh, some three to 4,000 years. Uh, no, I understand. I, I, you know, I know of the, the mythology and antiquity and all that, but I'm just curious, uh, 18th century New England. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, there may be. I mean, there, there are Indians. You know, every continent had a labyrinth pattern in use thousands of years ago independently and it's it's very interesting and that uh, uh because the circle is a circle of life you know it's a, it, it, there there are a lot of symbolisms uh, in it that i think are um uh, that uh, are just part of you know human life and human perspective uh, on life and 
uh, you know, the beginning and end and, you know, whether you're returning to the center or coming out of the center, there's just a lot of different ways to look at it. There's seed labyrinths. There's many different designs of labyrinths as well. And, uh, and again, there's a, there's a la labyrinth, uh, uh, if, if you Google Labyrinth Society, uh, you can come up with lots of resources. There are a lot of books available and there's a lot of uh, resources online to answer questions and lots of people out there to help with designs and answer questions. And I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Uh, I, I, they, they, you know, people can, you know, if they don't want to, not comfortable putting notes up uh, today, you know, send me a note uh, on my website, through my email, phone, whatever. Be happy to help. Okay. Well, uh, thank you again very much. Uh, I really appreciate you, you, you know, coming and, and, and speaking to us on this very fascinating topic. Uh, I want to uh, invite everyone currently on to join us next week uh, for something entirely different. Um, it will be a talk um, with Jennifer Levitz and Melissa Korn. They're two Wall Street Journal reporters and they'll be talking about their new book called Unacceptable Privilege, uh, Unacceptable Privilege, Deceit, and the Making of the College Admissions Scandal. So uh, no quiet contemplation there, unfortunately. But um, I would uh, invite everybody that is viewing tonight to join us next week. Uh, don't forget to join the Redwood Library itself or to um, subscribe to our new YouTube channel where the talk tonight and all of the other talks that we present are videographed and then uh, put on the YouTube channel for later viewing. So with that, I wanna thank everyone and Bill Ludwig and uh, hopefully we'll see you next week uh, for unacceptable privilege, deceit and the making of the college admission scandal. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, good evening. Bye-bye.